good evening and welcome. Tonight, I'm going to read to you some articles out of History Magazine. And our theme tonight is Iconic Symbols of Egypt. We're going to start off with obelisks, which if you don't know what that is, these big pointy towers you see over here. And then we are going to read about the Apis bowl, which you can see in this picture, in these hieroglyphs here. This man bowing down to the Apis bowl. These articles were chosen by my channel members. They were chosen by Alex, by Marta, Robot Canary and Alessia. And if you want to choose future History Magazine articles, you can click the join button that's just below the channel name down there somewhere. And you can join my channel membership for only 99 cents a month, the lowest possible price I can set it to. And you get all kinds of perks. You get your name at the start of every video. You get lots of behind the scenes goodies, lots of exclusive ASMR, among so much more. You get to watch every video before they're public. There's so many perks. So if you would like to join the channel memberships, you can do so there and help me pick future articles. But let's get right into it and read about obelisks. One of Cleopatra's needles, a 224-ton Egyptian obelisk, enveloped in hieroglyphs, stands today for all to admire, not in Cairo, but in London. The ancient Egyptians left behind a magnificent architectural legacy from their 3,000-year civilization. Undoubtedly, the obelisk is one of the most distinctive monumental expressions of that culture, yet few remain in Egypt today. The tall, tapered pillar was often placed in pairs outside of temple entrances. Originally erected in honor of the sun god Ra, the obelisk quickly caught on in Egypt and beyond, treasured as a spoil of war, a gift between nations, and a piece of history that world leaders sought to acquire. The first outsider known to be an admirer of the obelisk was the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal. After sacking Thebes in 664 BCE, he had a pair transported to the royal palace in Nineveh, now modern-day Iraq. Imperial Rome boasted various obelisks, some taken from Egypt, others manufactured at home. Today, Egyptian obelisks can be found in New York City, Istanbul, and Paris. The Greeks gave the monuments the name obeliskos, meaning small pointed pillars. The Egyptians, however, called it tekhen, a word of uncertain origin. Usually made of granite, obelisks are square in cross-section and taper slightly as they rise toward an apex topped by a small pyramid, or a pyramidion, as the Greeks called it. To reflect the sun's rays, the pyramidion was sometimes covered with gold or electrum, a naturally occurring alloy of gold and silver. The Egyptians called the pyramidion a benben, meaning to shine, to radiate. It symbolized the primordial hill, the seat from which Aten, a manifestation of Ra, created all that exists. Solar symbols, or an image of the reigning pharaoh protected by Ra, were also engraved on it. The base of the obelisk often featured figures of baboons, animals associated with the sun because of the haunting cries they make at dawn and dusk. The shaft, which supported the pyramidion and held it skyward, was usually inscribed with hieroglyphs in honor of the god it was dedicated to and the ruler who had commissioned the obelisk. The 
first obelisks. The ancient Egyptian monuments first appeared at the beginning of the 3rd millennium BCE in a northern Egyptian city home to the main cult of Ra. The city would later become known as Heliopolis, meaning City of the Sun in Greek. The Egyptians, meanwhile, called the place Iunu, or City of Pillars. An allusion to the obelisks that symbolized petrified sunbeams. Unfortunately, nothing remains today of Heliopolis, a place praised for its beauty. Its ruins lie hidden beneath a neighborhood in modern-day Cairo, and almost all of its ancient obelisks have disappeared. In the area of Abu Sir, just south of Cairo, the rulers of the 5th dynasty of the Old Kingdom built solar temples. Each had an open-air courtyard, in the middle of which stood an obelisk with a large altar for offerings at its base. These obelisks were built out of blocks of stone, but did not yet have the classical slender form. Although the solar temple ceased to be built after the 5th dynasty, the tradition of erecting obelisks spread throughout Egypt from the Middle Kingdom onward. It wasn't until the New Kingdom, however, that obelisks were built to the height for which they are now famed. New Kingdom obelisks, also carved from a single block of stone, were taller and slimmer than previous versions, making their extraction and raising even more complicated. Obelisks of the New Kingdom were almost always installed in pairs in front of the temple's monumental entrances, called pylons, where they provided symmetry. Italian Egyptologist Maurizio Damiano Appia argues that pairing may symbolize the sun and moon. Needles Not a single pair of Egyptian obelisks remains intact at its original location. The last set was commissioned by Ramses II, and it used to stand in front of the pylon at the Temple of Luxor. But in 1830, the Ottoman Viceroy of Egypt, Muhammad Ali, donated one of the two obelisks to the King of France. The monument stands majestically in the Place de la Concorde in Paris, where it was erected in 1836. During the New Kingdom, Thebes became the capital of Egypt and the center of the cult of Amun-Ra, a divinity born from the union of the Theban god Amun and the sun god Ra. The affinity between these two divinities was such that Thebes was also called Yunu Shemau, the Heliopolis of Upper Egypt. In the Theban sanctuaries of Karnak and Luxor, Numerous obelisks were erected, but today only three remain, two in the Temple of Karnak and one in Luxor. All the others were removed and transported to Europe during either the Roman Imperial period or the modern age. <clears throat> From the Nile to the Tiber. After the New Kingdom, erecting obelisks continued, but on a smaller scale. The final two date from the reign of Ptolemy IX Soter II, who commissioned the monuments for a temple dedicated to the goddess Isis on Philae Island. This marked the end for construction of obelisks in their homeland, but following Egypt's conquest by Romans in 30 BCE, the monoliths became popular elsewhere. Augustus Caesar began a tradition of transporting obelisks to Rome that would continue throughout the imperial period. At first, the obelisks were considered to be spoils of war, a symbol of Roman victory over Egypt. Later, as Egyptian cults became popular in Rome, they would be appreciated for their symbolic and religious significance. It was typical for a large obelisk to be placed in a Roman circus, where it would adorn a spina, the central barrier around which chariot races ran. In this context, obelisks maintained their defining link with the sun, since for the Romans, such races represented the trajectory of Apollo, god of the sun, across the sky. 
Smaller obelisks were usually placed in temples dedicated to Isis or Serapis, the Greco-Egyptian god. Today, Rome has 13 Egyptian obelisks, far more than any other city or country in the world. Some good trivia. Which country has the most obelisks? It's Italy. Obelisks of the Circus Maximus In 10 BCE, Augustus brought the first obelisk to Rome from Egypt. It was placed on the spina of the Circus Maximus. This pillar, the construction of which began under Seti I and was finished by Ramses II and his son Merneptah, came from Heliopolis and was made of red granite. Almost 78 feet high and weighing some 235 tons, it was transported from Egypt aboard a ship around 100 feet long and was displayed for the admiration of the people in the shipyard of Puzzoli, present-day Puzzoli, the Gulf of Naples. In 357 CE, to commemorate his 20th year on the throne, Constantius II had two obelisks moved from the Karnak Temple complex in Thebes. Originally commissioned by Pharaoh Tutmos III, the pillars were the tallest in the world at around a hundred feet high. Constantius first took them to Alexandria, and from there relocated one of them to Rome to place in the Circus Maximus. The second remained in Egypt until 390 CE, when Theodosius I decided to take it to Constantinople to decorate his Hippodrome, an ancient arena for horse and chariot races. With the passing of the centuries, almost nothing of the Circus Maximus survived, and its two obelisks were broken into three parts and lost under 23 feet of earth. In 1587, they were unearthed by order of Pope Sixtus V. After their restoration, the Augustan obelisk was placed at the Piazza del Popolo, while that of Constantius was installed in the square in front of the Basilica of St. John Lateran. <clears throat> in the first century CE, the Circus of Nero stood on Vatican Hill, where the Vatican stands today. Here, Nero executed thousands of Christians, including the Apostle Peter, after the Emperor blamed them for the burning of Rome. On the spina of Nero's circus stood an uninscribed obelisk that had been brought to the city by Caligula in the first year of his reign. According to first-century Roman scholar Pliny the Elder, this obelisk dates to the Middle Kingdom and had been commissioned by a son of Pharaoh Senusret I. After the abandonment of Nero's circus, the obelisk remained standing next to the basilica that the Emperor Constantine had built over the tomb of the Apostle Peter in the 4th century CE. Then, in 1585, Pope Sixtus V decided he wanted to move the obelisk in front of the new St. Peter's Basilica. Architect Domenico Fontana masterminded the removal an operation that involved 900 workers in 1586. A cross was placed on top of the newly positioned monument. The obelisk, present at the martyrdom of Peter, the first bishop of Rome, now stands in front of the basilica that bears his name, symbolizing the victory of the church over the pagan world. In the 19th century, the Roman tradition of transporting obelisks from Egypt resumed, but this time the monuments were gifts. The Egyptian government separated a pair of obelisks known as Cleopatra's Needles from Alexandria, sending one to New York City and the other to London. One of the Luxor obelisks was given to France and installed at the Place de la Concorde in Paris. New obelisks were also being built using modern techniques and materials, such as the Washington Monument in the United States' capital. Standing five times higher than those of Pharaonic Egypt, it symbolizes respect for a nation's founding father. The continued desire for obelisks around the world shows fascination remains strong, 
and ancient Egypt's influence continues to span millennia. Let's see, on this page, we have a bit of how the Vatican obelisk was moved and set up here. You can see they took the old location, lifted it up here, dragged it to the new spot in front of St. Peter's Basilica, and redecorated it. This you can tell is in Istanbul, because you can see the Hagia Sophia behind it. Beautiful obelisk there. Depiction here of the obelisk being sent across the Mediterranean with all these warriors tugging it along. A fragment of an obelisk here. Wow. This is in Rome. You can see the cross they added to the top. A drawing here of what the Circus Maximus looked like and how they decorated it. And the big old obelisk right there. They took a bunch of monuments from places they had conquered and decorated the center of the chariot races with them. Five different styles of obelisk here. Doesn't say which one's which, but very neat nonetheless. This is in France, I know because I've seen this one. This is the one in the Place de la Concorde. This is in Aswan, Egypt. It's an unfinished obelisk because it was cracked and they left it there and you can still see it today in this rock quarry here in Egypt. Here is a depiction of the two obelisks here. A repair. So this is Karn. Oh, no, sorry, this is Luxor. And you can see just one obelisk here. There used to be two, right? They came in pairs. This is. Where is this one? This is in Karn. You can see just the one obelisk left in Karnak. And the drawing here, does this show? There's the top of an obelisk right here, Pyramidion. It shows the pharaoh on it. This 1878 drawing by Emile Priest shows the pedestal on two sides of an obelisk. Oh, I see. So it's just a sketching of what it looked like. And this is the obelisk that's in Paris today, it says. And then this is, of course, Karnak. Two of three obelisks at the Temple of Amun at Karnak complex. Tower behind the great hypostyle hall. The obelisk of Tutmos I. And this is the obelisk of Hat Hatshepsut, his daughter. Very, very. You'd think that obelisks were just there to look cool. No, they all had meaning, of course. But not as much meaning as the Apis Bull, which was a very, very sacred god in Egypt. Let's read about it. Ancient Egyptians worshipped many gods and goddesses that took on animal forms, including cats, birds, even crocodiles. The falcon-headed god Horus depicted the divine pharaoh and the sun. Bast, or Bastet, was a cat goddess that protected homes from evil spirits. Sekhmet was the leonine goddess of war. The list goes on. But one was different. Apis the bull was not considered a god on earth in the same manner as other gods and goddesses. Instead of providing a mere link to the deity, the Apis Bull hosted the god himself. He was the divine incarnation, or herald, of Ta. The creator god of Memphis, ancient Egypt's capital city, Ta conceived the world and brought it into being. He eventually was fused with Sokar and Osiris to form a composite funerary deity, Ta Sokar Osiris. Worshippers bestowed upon this sacred bull living in Memphis the veneration and special rituals befitting any celestial god. There is no creation myth conveying how the Apis bull originated. 
but archaeological findings show he was first worshipped as a god of fertility and primordial power as early as the first dynasty. Ancient Egyptians called him Hap, or Hapi. Apis, the name commonly used today, is from the Greek transcription of the Egyptian name. At some point, Apis also became associated with Hathor, one of Egypt's most powerful goddesses. Again, the origins are unclear, but the connection was firmly established by the early dynastic period in Egypt, during which the bull was also linked to the power of the king. From then on, the worship of the Apis bull consistently thrived until the end of the Ptolemaic era. While other gods' popularity rose and fell throughout Egyptian history, the Apis remained a constant favorite, both in the Memphis region and nationally. The Chosen It was tradition that only one Apis bull existed at a time. The story of his birth, as related by 5th century BCE Greek historian Herodotus, states that fire from heaven comes down upon the cow, who then conceives the Apis. The heavenly fire emphasized the animal's divinity and gave it a powerful solar association. Several features identified the Apis bull. He was black with three white areas, the neck and sometimes the head, the back and the hindquarters. A sun disk emphasizing his divine solar aspect was placed between his horns, which were often covered with silver sheaths. Herodotus provided a slightly different description of the Apis. The bull had a white square on his forehead, an eagle-shaped mark on his back, and double hairs on his tail. Depictions of the bull varied over time, but a black and white color scheme remained the bull's core appearance. Once the priests had conducted an exhaustive search up and down the Nile to identify the Apis bull calf by its markings, the bull and his mother were taken in a procession by boat to the city of Nilopolis, about 50 miles south of Memphis. From there, the calf and his mother went to Memphis, where the calf was enthroned and hailed as a god. The Apis was kept in a special enclosure near the Temple of Ta. During the Apis' lifetime, people from all over Egypt visited Memphis to worship the bull. He was prayed to, offered to, and cared for as a living god. He made public appearances in processions and at religious festivals. As the Apis had oracular powers, people consulted the bull and sought guidance. Honored in the Afterlife If the bull lived for 25 years without illness or accident, he was then ceremoniously killed in a ritual representing the life, death, and resurrection cycle. It was believed the bull was renamed Osiris Apis after fusing with the god Osiris, ruler of the afterworld and controller of rebirth and resurrection. A new bull would replace the old one as the host of Apis' eternal spirit. Given the same care as a deceased king or noble, the Osiris Apis was transported to the place of embalming within the Ta temple enclosure. Calcite embalming tables still stand there today. A unique papyrus dating from the 2nd century BCE describes part of the embalming of the Apis bull. A section of the scrolls now in Vienna's Kunsthistorisches Museum, which I probably mispronounced, but the very beginning is in the Archaeological Museum in Zagreb, Croatia. The papyrus also contains the rituals associated with the death of Apis. Priests and the entire populace mourned for the 70 days of embalming. The priests wore funerary garments and gave up washing and animal foods for the duration. The papyrus provides basic instructions on eviscerating the animal purifying the body cavity, placing incense in the body, positioning the bowl, and wrapping it. After mummification, soldiers or priests pulled the Osiris Apis bull on a multi-wheeled, elaborately decorated wooden wagon. 
He was carried to the burial place in the nearby cemetery of Saqqara. The funerary procession was grand, with priests, musicians, mourners, sacred dancers, and two young women acting out the role of the goddesses Isis and Nephthys, yeah, Nephthys the chief mourner of the gods. People lined the route to glimpse the mummified god as he was taken on his last journey on earth. Bull Burials The earliest Apis tomb that has been found dates from the reign of Amenhotep III. Initially, bulls were buried at Saqqara, which served as the necropolis for Memphis, in freestanding tombs comprising a small above-ground chapel decorated with images of the Apis, other gods, and the king. A rock-cut rectangular burial chamber lay below it. Under Ramses II, Chemweset, the king's fourth son, who served as the high priest of Ta, created a new type of tomb for the Apis, extensive subterranean catacombs with separate side chambers for each bull. This is known as the Serapium, after the underworld deity Serapis, a name shortened from Osiris Apis in the Hellenic period. French archaeologist Auguste Mariette discovered and excavated the Serapium in 1851. At least 64 mummified bulls have been found to date. There are two main sections in the Serapium. Arranged along a north-south axis, the lesser vaults were used in the early 26th dynasty, with the bulls interred in wooden coffins. The greater vaults, following an east-west axis, were initiated by Samtik I in 612 BCE, and starting in 547 BCE, under Amasis II, the bulls were buried in gigantic granite sarcophagi. No burial chamber in the greater vaults was found completely undisturbed, and thus the details of the later bulls' burials remain obscure. The three intact burials that have been found date from the late 14th to 13th century BCE. One, dating from Horm Heb's reign, held a wooden sarcophagus with a mummy that consisted of a bull's skull, supported by a black oval resinous mass possibly originally wrapped in linen. When Mariette examined the mass, he found it included fragments of cattle bones that had been gathered and covered with black resinous material. The other burials date from the reign of Ramses II. The first two were found in a decorated chamber that contained large wooden sarcophagi painted black, with similar masses of bull bones and four calcite canopic jars human heads for the bulls' viscera. A third burial, discovered in the lesser vaults, comprised a wooden sarcophagus holding what appeared to be a human mummy with a gilded face mask, accompanied by funerary figurines with bulls' heads, inscribed with the name of the Apis. However, the mummy, which was bedecked in jewelry, was, like the masses found in the earlier intact burials, made up of fragmentary bull bones. Some scholars have interpreted the fragmentary state of the bull remains in these early apis burials as evidence that the dead bull was eaten by the king and the priests to obtain divine power. The bones were then mixed with resin, wrapped up and buried. Others suggest these might be pious reburials of apis bulls that had been violated when the Assyrians or other foreign groups overran Egypt. A French-Egyptian team is exploring the lesser vaults of the Serapium, hoping to discover new parts of the catacombs that might contain intact tombs, since some bulls seem to be missing from the archaeological record. Such new discoveries will help to better understand the Apis cult and the secrets of bull mummification. Oh, that's the last page. Let's see, this is a statue of Serapis, the underworld deity here, looking very Greek, huh? A depiction here of this person consulting the bull. No, that's not just any person, that's Alexander the Great, it says, visiting the Apis bull in Memphis. Well, that's pretty epic. 
Wow. There's a Shopti here with the head of the Apis bull found in the Serapium, it says. Here's the chambers here in the Serapium. Pretty incredible. And here's one of those big tombs they had. The big, what was it, granite? They said? Please. Yeah, granite sarcophagi. Another depiction here, bowing to the bull. And this is great. This is a beautiful painting here of a procession with the bull right here. You can see dancers, musicians, all the priests. Um, a priest here and someone depicting the goddess. Pretty amazing picture here. And you can see the bull's white spots. So you know it is the Apis bull. Here's the sarcophagus. No, sarcophagus. The papyrus they're talking about with the mummification instructions. We've got a sacred bull here and a sacred snake too. <laughs> and this is an actual mummified apis bull. There's his head and torso, I suppose. Really beautifully wrapped, right? They gave him big eyes. This is a very famous site in Egypt. It is the Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara. It was the first Egyptian pyramid, probably the first pyramid, to be honest. It's a very old, old structure. It's another drawing of the Apis bull. And what's this? So it's a golden figurine found in Tut's tomb, it says. Uh, oh, this is a Ta, the god that's supposed to be uh, represented or living inside the Apis bull. We have this picture here. So that is it for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Again, if you want to pick History Magazine articles, you can click the Join button down there. If you don't see it, if you're on mobile, it's the very first link in the description box. Okay, if you want to join, please feel free to do so. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a good, good, Good night.